When people think about Japan, they think of samurai, anime, and the calm and peaceful aesthetic that has come to characterize Japanese culture. And when people think about African Americans, they think of athletes, hip hop, and a culture often associated with a struggle for freedom and justice. These thoughts offer such disparate ideas of what these two groups are, and yet, despite this, Japanese and African Americans have an unexpected relationship that can be summed up as strange, if not admirable. And truthfully, it's unusual because there's no questioning that Japan has a culture that discriminates against foreigners, which is to be expected since Japan is one of the most homogeneous societies on the planet, with 98% of its population being ethnically Japanese. And despite this, Japan appears to have an appreciation and respect for African American culture that at times defies and goes against the status quo and the duality of the country itself. I'll dive into this duality of the country later, but this appreciation and respect has earned Japan a soft spot in the hearts of many African Americans, to the point where it's difficult to find a black person that dislikes Japanese people despite several international incidents such as the racial attacks against the winner of Miss Universe Japan 2015 that have shown over and over again that Japanese people heavily discriminate against black people. To understand why there's such a contradiction, we'll need to look at Japan's modern history and how African Americans have influenced it. The history of Japan is a long one, so I'll skip over the Yayoi people arriving to the island from the Korean Peninsula, the spread of Buddhism in Japan, and go directly to its Zengoku and Edo periods. You see, Japan has an extremely family-oriented culture, so during its feudal era, which lasted from 1185 to 1603, these families or clans fought back and forth to have their leaders appointed the title of the shogun. Shoguns were military rulers of Japan and second only to the emperor of Japan itself. But for all intents and purposes, shoguns were the true rulers of Japan because these shoguns typically came from clans with a lot of land, political power, and military power in the form of daimyos and samurais. During the Zengoku period during the feudal era, this shogunate system fell apart for about a hundred years because the Ashikaga shogunate couldn't control its daimyos and samurais, and it wasn't until the arrival of the Portuguese in 1543 that things started to change. When the Portuguese arrived, they brought with them better technology for warfare, and one of the daimyos, Oda Nobunaga, alongside his retainers Toyotomi Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ayesu, used these weapons to subjugate other daimyos to unify a divided Japan. Tokugawa Ayesu became shogun at the end of all this in 1603, and he ended up closing Japan from the outside world in 1639 to curb Western influence. This period of the Tokugawa clan rule, lasting between 1603 to 1868, is known as the Edo period. During this time, Japan focused internally, developed a stronger national identity, and built roads and infrastructure to better unify the country. There were still some contact with the West, specifically with the Dutch, but for all intents and purposes, Japan was isolated completely from the rest of the world for more than 200 years. This policy of isolationism came to an end when Matthew Perry arrived in 1853 with battleships to open Japan for trade with the United States. This arrival of the United States eventually led to a war between the Emperor and the Shogun at the time because supporters of the Emperor felt that the Shogun was allowing Western influence to diminish Japan the same way Western influence diminished other Asian countries like China and India. The Emperor at the time, Mutsuhito, or Emperor Meiji as he came to later be known, came on top of this power struggle and ushered in the Meiji Restoration. Political and military power were consolidated under imperial rule and this led to rapid industrialization as the Japanese people realized that their isolationist policy set it far behind western capabilities in both science and military might. They also realized that between the Portuguese arrival in 1543 and the end of its isolationism in 1853, European powers had gone on to dominate the entire world. And now, Japan was part of the dominated because Japan had to open its ports not by choice, but by force. And this is where African Americans and the duality of Japan comes into play. You see, 
when Japan realized that it was far behind and that Asia was getting taken over by the Western world, it came to them as a shock because even though they were isolated for over 200 years, they maintained some contact with Western science to the Dutch. So, in order to better understand their position, Japanese leaders sent delegates out into the European dominated world. These delegates traveled to various parts of Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas and reported back their findings. They regarded Africa and Asia as backwards and Europe and North America as advanced and developed. But there was one group of people they met that massively influenced their ambitions to modernize, and this group was African Americans. When the Japanese delegates arrived in the United States in the 1860s, America had just been through a civil war and was reconstructing. A core tenant of this reconstruction period was to rebuild America and give more rights to African Americans. This meant giving African Americans access to higher education and jobs. But even before this, there were free men in the United States who not only had education and skilled jobs, but were respected and thriving members of Western society at least more so than slaves. The Japanese came to see this as a model on which to develop their young country because despite African Americans being colored, they were modernized and westernized and understood democracy and capitalism as a direct result of Western education. In addition to this, African Americans in the post-Civil War era were holding political offices within the country that was at the same time subjugating them. Based on these findings, Japanese leaders believed they could also develop Japan through Western education and catch up to Western white superiors. Japanese students were subsequently enrolled in Ivy Leagues and historically black colleges and universities like Howard University. They learned about the African American struggle and for some time, they prioritized translating and publishing works about African Americans for the Japanese consumption, the first of which was Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1896. To say Japan was obsessed with African Americans would be an understatement. They consumed and learned about black culture to a point where true solidarity was developed between African Americans and the Japanese. After all, both groups were considered inferior and were being dominated by the white Western world. African American leaders and intellectuals like Lansden Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, and James Weldon Johnson even visited Japan to exchange ideas and strengthen cultural ties. Because, much like African Americans who had been emboldened by the Pan-African movement, Japanese people came to be emboldened by Pan-Asianism. In a sense, Japanese and African Americans were both in a struggle to gain respect and equality in a white world. But when Japan became more modernized and started winning major wars like the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, it started seeing itself as being more equal to white westerners and therefore more superior than other colored people. This is where Japan's duality comes into play. For all intents and purposes, Japan had modernized. It was stronger militarily and economically and had somehow kept its cultural identity. On top of this, it was winning wars. So unlike other colored people and specifically countries in Asia that had been subjugated by Western powers, Japan started seeing itself as an exception and therefore superior not only to colored people but also to other Asians. Instead of being dominated, it needed to do the domination, to take Asia back from Western powers and have a Pan-Asian bloc with Japan at the helm. This Pan-Asian ideology and a belief that they were on equal footing with Western powers influenced almost every single military decision they made between the 1890s to the end of World War II and its eventual demilitarization. It also influenced their connection with African Americans and their own Pan-African ideology. For Japan, the African Americans struggle for freedom and equality, the injustice they faced and their culture was a template on which to model their new country. They in some ways identified with and admired the African American struggle because they were fighting against the same systems and powers. This template would also help Japan avoid the mistakes African Americans made in still being treated unequally despite being westernized. Unsurprisingly, this desire for recognition as equals didn't work out fully as intended, but after World War II, Japan came to hold a special status among Western powers. 
Western countries and honestly the world at large sees Japan differently. Sure, they are Asian, but at the same time they are regarded as having Western sensibilities and seen as Western equals. Despite this duality Japan had achieved at the end of World War II, African American influence on Japanese society persists to this day. African Americans influenced not only the Buraku Men Civil Rights Movement in Japan, but also contemporary Japanese music like Japanese blues and jazz as well as city pop. It's therefore no surprise that most African Americans feel an affinity and respect towards the Japanese, because in a way, modern Japan did the legwork to understand and appreciate African Americans, and it shows in their popular music and popular media like anime and manga which portrays black people more fairly than western media. I could make a whole video on the portrayal of African Americans in anime, but for the sake of brevity, it should be known that black characters in Japanese media don't carry the same stereotypes they carry in western media. Arguments could be made that the stereotype of black strength and brutality is often portrayed by some of these black characters, but in stories where every other character who is not black is also just as strong or brutal, this argument fails to stand its ground. And this is why African Americans are heavily drawn to anime because unlike western media, there's more positive, diverse and relatable characters. And this is a direct outcome of Japan's relationship with African Americans dating back to the 1860s. Another argument could be made that African Americans didn't influence modern Japan any more than other groups of people. After all, the catalyst for Japanese leaders ending their isolationist policy was a direct response to white western influence. But the reality is that Japan found itself in the same position as other Asian countries and well, the rest of the world. The sole exception in a world dominated by white westerners were African Americans who were not only westernized but were actively gaining rights and revolting against white supremacy in proximity. African Americans were therefore the perfect group of people to learn from and understand and also to respect, admire and imitate. To sum things up, the odd relationship between Japan and African Americans is a direct result of Japan's history. When Japan came out of isolation, African Americans had the closest proximity to whiteness in addition to also being westernized. In a world where everyone else that wasn't white was seen as inferior, Japan's understanding and respect for African Americans was pivotal in shaping itself as modernized and westernized in order to separate itself from the pack. Even after this separation from the pack and being seen as western equals after World War II, African American impact on Japanese culture remains to this day and shows itself in their music and their media, and the future of this odd relationship remains to be seen.